right, I think we are live now. And welcome everyone. My name is Todd Scatini. I am the Managing Director from Cognitive Harmony Technologies. Uh, and I'm bringing to the stage today my good friend Edmund DeVoe, Senator Sylvia Santana. Um, Sorry. Okay. So uh, the, the title of our panel today is uh, Leveling the Playing Field for Social Equity Applicants in New Jersey. Um, Cognitive Harmony Technologies has sponsored this because we want to talk a little bit about what we're doing with technology um, in the state of New Jersey. Uh, we're using technology really to level the playing field by providing education, training, tools, support, and expertise really at a fraction of a cost to, to anyone trying to enter the cannabis industry. You know, we're essentially democratizing the application process in the hopes of affecting the re-legalization of cannabis in a responsible and impactful way. Uh, we've created a platform now that uses technology. Uh, we believe it will educate and empower generations. Uh, we recognize uh, cognitive harmony technologies that are experiencing a, really a paradigm shift in the re-legalization of cannabis. And it takes real leadership like we have on our panel today and technology to envision and guide such a paradigm shift. So I'm really proud to host this, this event. It is our hope that, that this platform will really assist in improving social equity within the cannabis industry and social justice along the way. We hope that this will empower entire communities to have a deeper understanding of cannabis and with the opportunity it presents to these communities. So the re-legalization of cannabis is good for public policy. It is good public policy. It leads to better health and wellness in our communities. And that is something that I think we can all agree that we, we can use a little bit of more today. Um, so I'm really excited to bring this conversation today. Uh, I have two leaders with us, uh, both on public policy, experts in public policy, one in Michigan and one in New Jersey. Um, so I'm happy to make this introduction today and help forward along this conversation. Uh, we have with us, first and foremost, Senator Sylvia Santana from the state of Michigan. Uh, Senator Santana is a criminal justice reform advocate. She represents the cities of Detroit, Dearborn, and Melvindale. Uh, she is a mi the minority vice chair of the Department of Health and Human Services budget. Uh, and she is also the minority vice chair of the licensing and regulatory affairs budget, which is the budget for the marijuana Re regulatory agency in Michigan. So thanks a lot for bringing your experience uh, today, Senator Santana. Um, and so uh, but let me first introduce, uh, I'm also joined today by my good friend, Edmund DeVoe, the president of the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association. Edmund is a fellow veteran from the Army. Uh, he's a partner at Burton, Burton Trent Public Affairs. Um, the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association is the largest cannabis trade organization, often dubbed the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce. He helped in the formation of this organization and its mission, forming a responsible, sustainable, diverse, and profitable cannabis industry. He was named the 420 Trailblazer in Cannabis by the Network, and he's also been listed on New Jersey's Top 100 Cannabis Insider. Uh, thanks a lot to both of you for joining us. Senator Santana, uh, welcome to the stage and, 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 and thank you for joining us. Can you talk to us? I think today we have an opportunity to kind of talk some lessons learned perhaps since Michigan is maybe a year ahead, two years ahead of uh, New Jersey at this point. And I was wondering if you could give us some observations on how it's going and uh, you know what, what New Jersey has in store for it. Yeah, thank you, Todd, for uh, having me here today on behalf of the state of Michigan. I'm ha definitely happy to uh, talk about some of the things that we have learned uh, during this process of um, the legalization of re recreation of marijuana in our state. Um, when you look at the fact that um, our state, our constituency across the board have uh, supported uh, recreational marijuana. One in three people actually supported this initiative, as well as in the city of Detroit, one in six people supported legalization of marijuana. I think that um, some of the things that we have learned across the board is that this is something that our constituency um, overwhelmingly have asked for. And I think that when we look at the fact that um, so many people in several communities across our states um, have disproportionately been incarcerated for possession 
or distribution of marijuana, we do have a long road ahead when it comes to um, how we help support those individuals moving forward and making sure that we're not continuing to um, incarcerate them for something that we have obviously legalized in our state. Um, so that's something that I think that uh, we need to continue to work towards. Um, but there, we have uh, taken the liberty in our state to make sure that um, those who do have just a possession charge are no longer incarcerated for marijuana. Um, the other big thing I will say that from the uh, social equity standpoint, uh, there was a couple things that we've learned through this process, um, you know, in our state. Uh, one of the key things that we have learned that from a social equity um, licensure standpoint, we had uh, not a lot of people who actually applied for that licensure um, in the state of Michigan, probably next to none. And, um, por and partially that reason being that um, just the way that the social equity license was um, the actual process in which an uh, individual could actually apply for that uh, licensure was, it, it can be, ha has been quite challenging, but even still um, just the, qualifications and how they had to proceed with the actual process of starting a business, um, taking a, um, a plant from actually the seed to growth, um, definitely is not equitable to uh, those who are uh, applying for licensure um, in our state who may have the actual means and monetary ability to apply for a license where they don't have to take the plant from the seed to actual maturity. And so that in itself was um, something that was disproportionately different. But I think that we have made some strides from a social equity standpoint to make sure that uh, people in our state whose communities like mine, uh, who were disproportionately impacted by uh, the war on drugs, um, obviously have an opportunity to be able to be in this space. But we do have a long road ahead when it comes to our social equity licensure. Yes, ma'am. I mean, we, you know, we often talk about building this industry from the underground up because, you know, for a long time, it was really forced underground and not until, you know, the mid uh, 1990s did we start to re-legalize it in, in the country. And it's just amazing that it was such a such a uh, important fabric that ran through the history of our nation for such a long time. Um, you know, we're finally getting the ability to look at it and really professionalize it and make it a real industry again. And it's going gangbusters. Um, and, and all over the country. Uh, Edmund, would you talk to us a little bit about New Jersey and, and share with us, because I think New Jersey now has like the most social equity and economic equity focused uh, set of rules that's out there in the state. Can you explain to us what it looks like in the state of New Jersey uh, and what the opportunity that is out there for a social equity applicant? Sure. Thanks so much, Ty. It's an honor to be here. Senator, it's such a pleasure to meet you as uh, we, in fact, did uh, lift some of Michigan's, uh, <laughs> some of the better parts of, of what you were able to accomplish. Uh, so let me, let me give the, the framework as, as to why this is such a, a pertinent conversation, especially in New Jersey today. Uh, let's go back 10 years ago when the state actually implemented its medical marijuana program, 10 years old, uh, fast forward, 10 years later, we have essentially, not essentially, we actually have just uh, 12 license holders in 10 years on the medical side of things. Uh, we had gone through fits and starts with respect to how do we do this? How do we do it right? Uh, there was a, a lot of soul searching, actually, in New Jersey. Uh, we, we struggled as, as a state uh, being able to develop a, a uh, an expanded medical marijuana program, much less getting into an, an adult use market. Uh, the soul searching uh, came uh, by way of uh, not just politics, but but the sociology of New Jersey. Uh, we are the the most densely populated state in the union. You have cities that abut suburbs, that abut uh, agricultural communities, and so the balancing act that had to take place. Uh, took essentially four years. Uh, fast forward from 10 years ago, uh, a, a, a languishing medical marijuana program. Uh, then candidate Murphy, 
uh, uh, was running on a platform of we are going to have a a med- a uh, adult use cannabis market within the first hundred days uh, of my administration. He never wavered. Uh, he stuck with that. He won uh, just uh, overwhelmingly uh, the, the gubernatorial election, and 100 days became a thousand days. Uh, you could you could blame the legislature. You could blame the lobbyists. You could blame uh, the the 12 uh, license holders. Uh, but but regardless of, of who you point the finger at, uh, we struggled getting an adult use program to to the point of uh, being being here today and being able to talk about now we have regulations. Mm. Uh, we, we struggled and ultimately not even the legislature could get it done. Uh, the legislature more or less punted uh, to the to the population, to the voting population of New Jersey. And in November of 2020, overwhelmingly, at a, at a rate of two to one, the voters of New Jersey changed the constitution of the state to allow for an adult use program, changed the constitution, then followed legislation. Again, the, the, the painstaking process of getting legislation in place, but the legislation did do a couple of really good things. It created a cannabis regulatory commission, a CRC. So it took the the uh, program programming away from the legislature, and it took it away from the Department of Health. and And so now we have a singular entity that is focused on not only expanding the medical program, uh, but actually the program uh, percentages percentages of tax revenue going to disadvantaged communities. That was in the legislation. Uh, creation of licensing categories, micro licenses, licenses for minorities, women, and disabled veterans. Creating that category was huge. The CRC, the Cannabis Regulatory Commission, took that, took that uh, ran with it once they were fully seated, and not only uh, boosted the micro license categories, and I'll explain how in a moment, but they did in fact create a definition, a defined social equity applicant. Prior to August of of 2021, there was no such thing as a social equity applicant. People were talking about being one, but there was no definition for one. So now we have a social equity applicant definition we have micro licenses. Uh, we have conditional licensing, which the CRC adopted. Uh, the bottom line, Todd and Senator, is this. In New Jersey, what we've been able to do is uh, create a standard of license, which lowered the bar to entry. Micro licenses uh, by infrastructure are smaller, but, that's lo- but that lowers the bar to entry. Uh, micro licenses are, are also mitigating risk. You have less square footage, you have less crop that you have to be responsible for. But at the same time, after a year, you can in fact go for a conventional license. Uh, the last point I'll make is this. Uh, once the, on the day that the regulations were published, uh, August 19th of 2021, the CRC executive director, Jeff Brown, made it clear that once the requests for applications are issued for the expanded medical and adult use markets, that micro license, social equity licenses, and conditional licensing applicants will go to the front of the line. It's not necessarily that, uh, not necessarily meant that you will automatically get a license, but you will receive priority. Uh, consideration for your licenses. So to that, I applaud our CRC. Uh, I do applaud the governor who stuck with it for four years, uh, making sure that we got here. He signed uh, our legislation. There are a couple of legislators that really stand out, uh, but uh, but New Jersey has come a long way. And yes, we beat New York. We beat Pennsylvania. <laughs> and so we're, we're thrilled with that. 
<laughs> well, congratulations for that. I know that I, you know, but regionalization as, as legalization spreads will really become important, right? Regionalization will be a big deal. And this tri-state area is just going to be crushing it. And I think, you know, Senator Santana, you'll likely be seeing the same thing between Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, the Midwest in general is kind of exploding. Um, I was wondering, ma'am, if you might be able to share with us a little bit of your experience in terms of, um, you know, any surprises that might have been had within the legalization process, especially within communities that perhaps didn't want to welcome it initially, but now have. Uh, and, and I'll just give you an example. In the state of New Jersey, there are 565 municipalities and just over 90 at last um, last time I looked at it. Uh, had opted in and said, yeah, in my backyard, we're going to have cannabis and we're going to uh, seize this opportunity. But the others are very frightened. And so what would you say to them? Have there been any surprises out of uh, Michigan that, that you'd highlight? Well, I definitely will say from a, you know, just from the standpoint, there are some communities who have decided to opt out of uh, the, you know, having uh recreational facilities or even medicinal facilities or uh, marijuana in their uh, communities. I'm not surprised by that, um, but I think that, you know, they're missing an opportunity to um, obviously have revenues that could potentially um, be supportive of their communities overall. And so I will say that what we're finding is it's a crawl, walk, run situation where um, other communities are really taking a look at those who have opted into having uh, dispensaries and and the like in their communities to see what the outcomes will be. So just like um, Edmund said earlier, you know, they looked at what Michigan did and um, definitely tried to provide a robust policy for New Jersey. Same with um, even within our confines of our own cities that um, some of the bigger, you know, the cities who have opted in are watching, the smaller cities are watching um, and who have not opted in are watching to see how uh, those other cities who have opted in do. Um, so it's been uh, rather interesting. Uh, council, city councils are making decisions on ordinances, um, just like in the city of Detroit. Uh, we've seen where we do have recreational facilities. We're looking at, uh, you know, the fact that our city council has uh, made sure that those uh, facilities are not in areas where churches and schools reside. Um, and there's been conversation about um, you know, potentially uh, modifying that to accommodate uh, potential other facilities. So it has been a robust conversation. I will say from a community standpoint, uh, there was a lot of pushback when recreational marijuana became a conversation um, in our municipality. And so um, that has been a big conversation about um, just, you know, from a neighborhood standpoint, how does this impact um, safety and how does it impact uh, crime in our neighborhood. So, you know, there's been a lot um, to this conversation that is really important. Um, you know, last year alone, communities that opted in uh, received about 1200k and, you know, per their, you know, per store as far as revenue. So that is something that uh, really makes a huge difference in a municipality where they're, you know, having a budget deficit. So um, it is an opportunity for those who have not opted in, but uh, definitely we will see what happens moving forward. I think as um, you start to see more dispensaries in the marketplace, you start to see where uh, those cities who have opted in are doing well and that it's been regulated and they um, have found, you know, where the, uh, you know, there's opportunity for improvement, then I think those other cities will follow suit. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I mean, when we see small businesses start thriving in those communities, then we see the benefits come back into that community. Edmund, you know, the, the opportunities for small business people in uh, cannabis in New Jersey is just through the roof, right? And can you talk a little bit about how the state has empowered small business and what uh, NJ, the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association does to, to help them? Sure. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Standing up the, the initial marketplace, uh, to be honest with you, uh, you had to be a large organization. You had to have the financial wherewithal to help get the, the footprint uh, of an industry in place. But since that point, uh, what we've been able to do and what we were successful at as an association 
in working with the legislature and working with the CRC is that uh, we we focused on making sure that the small businesses got a break. Uh, we, we created opportunities for entrepreneurship. Uh, so it's it goes beyond just the micro licensing category and the social equity uh, category. New Jersey created six classes of licenses. You have cultivation, you have processing, you have warehouse and distribution, you have transportation, you have dispensary and dispensary with consumption lounge. So creating those six licensing categories means that, you know, you really can't be too big because you can't fit into some of those spaces. You'll be too big. This this is actually a great way to make sure that uh, a person in a community who wants to put a business in that community has the opportunity to do so in one of six regulated fashions. Uh, the Canada Business Association uh, is, is proud because we represent not just the current license holders, but we represent the future applicants as well as all of the ancillary businesses. And so what we've been doing uh, through uh, right now virtual networking uh, we've had an opportunity for some of those ancillary businesses to connect. Uh, I've gotten great reports from from some of those members saying, you know, even before we stand up the cannabis industry, I'm a transportation person. I got a call from a security company, and now we're working together. Uh, nothing makes me prouder, and nothing should make the state prouder than to know that uh, this cannabis chamber of commerce is actually doing what a chamber of commerce does. And so while we look forward to uh, expanding and come, come out of uh, COVID mode, per se, uh, again, just looking at uh, the opportunities that, that abound for small businesses uh, to get engaged, either from a support service or ancillary business purpose uh, to, to actually touching the plant. It, it is providing opportunity. Yeah. And, and, you know, I was so I was so proud of New Jersey when they said that, you know, we are going to license the social consumption of this plant. For me, there's a massive opportunity within that. And and I've gone, you know, to all of the veteran service organizations across the country and said, you know, the VSO of the future is the one that that really embraces the social consumption of cannabis uh, and, and other wellness products as opposed to bringing folks in and, and have an alcohol only uh, the, the post 9-11 veteran wants to consume cannabis um, and wants access to this and, and to consume it socially is something that can be very enriching, very empowering, and I know can lead to better mental health and wellness for veterans. Um, Senator Santana, I was wondering, I, I know that you have veterans with your family and uh, have some thoughts on the veteran community and, and how um, that could be impacted by cannabis. And I was wondering, in, in Michigan, is it possible to do to have social consumption? It is a you know a possibility to have social consumption here in the state of Michigan. However, when you talk about the social, the lounging, uh, we do have individuals from neighboring states who do come here uh, to have that social um, aspect of uh, marijuana, but however, we don't have any lounges to support them. So you have people who are um, actually consuming in their vehicles, which is legal. Um, and so we're trying to find a way to make sure as we move forward from a policy standpoint that um, those uh, consumption lounges do exist. Um, I will say from, you know, from my husband's a veteran uh, and also my father is a veteran as well. Um, I will say that there, you know, we have a lot of opportunity here in our state. Uh, we just appropriated $20 million to have uh, more of a study done from a veteran standpoint on just the uh, consumption of medicinal and uh, research around that area. So we um, are looking forward to see what the outcomes will be from that research um, to see how we can support the DOD in uh, making some more robust decisions for our state and also for the entire country. I mean, as you continue to see states um, get to a point where they're approving uh, marijuana, whether it be medicinal or recreation in their states, I think that it, it, it's, it's only natural for the federal government to follow suit to 
take this off as a Schedule One drug. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, I believe that, you know, through the $20 million that we've appropriated, that we are going to find over that five-week study what will be the outcomes. My father, for example, came out of the Army, um, had a heroin addiction and mental health, and spent most of his time incarcerated because of his heroin addiction. And so what if that opportunity existed for him to have uh, an alternative like medicinal marijuana to help relieve his pain. Um, so I think that we are only um, doing the right thing here um, in Michigan, and I hope other states will follow suit. Yes, ma'am. Edmund, you want to follow up anything with that? Any uh, sure. consumption spaces that you're hearing about that are of interest? Well, any, you know, any, any close to the uh, to the Newark Airport by chance where I'm looking? I'm <laughs> Well, you know, Todd, when, when we talk about uh, being proud of, of the work that we've done, uh, I'll go back to when we were working on the legislation and creating the licensing categories. The conversation was not around getting high. It was about getting well. And more importantly, the, 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 the consumption lounge notion is steeped in social justice. The conversation went like this. If you are living in public housing, if you are living, living in federally subsidized housing, you could be evicted for using the same medicine that someone in the suburbs or a, a homeowner or uh, a non-subsidized uh, unit could, could use. So they are using the same medicine that you are, but you could lose your home for it. Thus, the notion of consumption lounge came into existence because we had to give people a safe space to get well. We needed to, to level the playing field with respect to uh, medicinal use. And, uh, and so with that in mind, uh, again, we're, we're just proud that that is what drove the notion of consumption lounge. Uh, and uh, I, I applaud uh, the senator in Michigan for appropriating uh, funds uh, to get to the heart of uh, the, the veteran matters. Uh, it, it, it's Todd, look, you you should be applauded because I'm familiar, very familiar with your work uh, with brain injuries and, uh, and getting veterans uh, the help that they need. So I applaud you and thank you for even making me a small part of that conversation. It is my pleasure. It is my pleasure. It has been a, a goal of mine to to have the Department of Defense really shine their research lens on this plant. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's required for that is academia, the academic backbone um, that that is in Michigan, the academic backbone that is in New Jersey and all along the eastern coast. Um, now, when that is energized, and when, when they have no fear of losing their federal funding by looking at this plant, then we're on our way. You know, I've long said that, that if, if the DOD and the federal government were to be behind medical cannabis research, the United States will immediately become the global leader in medical cannabis research, bottom line. And, and I think that we could help forward a revolution in medical affairs uh, that could perhaps help us get out of this opioid crisis that the entire country is suffering from as well as the suicide crisis that is very prevalent within the military and, and within uh, law enforcement and first responders, especially now after COVID. So we certainly need this right now. Um, Senator Santana, can you share with us a little bit about um, what's the buzz among the academics in the state of Michigan? Are they just excited to be able to write for publication, uh, you know, on a plant that we haven't been able to research for over 80 years? I would say absolutely. You're absolutely right. We have several universities here who are um, itching at the opportunity to really start um, having this conversation and finding ways to make this uh, actual academic uh, degree. Uh, when you look at MSU and their ag department, that is definitely a direction they're looking to go. Uh, we also have Wayne State, who is also a key uh, role, has a key role in making sure that research is done on the medicinal side. I'll just tell you from my perspective, I've had the opportunity to talk to so many uh, 
individuals, students who have uh, gra graduated from MSU with an agricultural uh, degree. And guess what? They're working in the cannabis industry. And so because they understand uh, from their own perspective, maybe not from their degrees perspective, but they understand the cultivation process. And so uh, when you look at the opportunity that exists for our universities to be a part of this conversation uh, moving into the future is definitely something that I feel that is going to be very uh, a robust conversation, but also from an education standpoint is going to provide for those individuals who um, understand the science, science behind the growth of marijuana that is going to really make the industry continue to move forward. You have to understand the, the, the science behind that plant. And I think that education and our universities are really going to have a key role in both perspectives. So, Yeah, absolutely. And I, I tell you, there is so much technology and so many advances that are being made in the cultivation of this plant. Um, we're seeing these start to transfer over to the way we're cultivating food and I think will eventually, you know, affect the way we feed our planet, maybe growing our food closer to where it's consumed, um, which will be a good thing, you know, in terms of our carbon footprint. So, uh, Edmund, what, what can you tell us about academia in New Jersey? Are they also doing the same thing? And we, we're working with Stockton University through Cognitive Harmony. We, uh, our, our accelerator participants get a certificate uh, uh, from their cannabis science program. What other programs are out there in uh, the state of New Jersey? Well, my alma mater, uh, Rutgers RU, uh, has been uh, extremely uh, active in the hemp space. Uh, it's agricultural campus, uh, the Cook Campus, uh, formerly Cook College, uh, has, has done a tremendous job in terms of uh, not only hemp studies, but, but uh, food studies, the food sciences. Uh, are, are all handled there on, on Cook. A lot of the uh, universities are moving towards uh, academic programs, certificate programs, and eventually, uh, we're, we hope, will be full degree programs in, in cannabis sciences. As you mentioned, Stockton, uh, the, the Cannabis Business Association has a uh, strategic alliance with Stockton, uh, we've been blessed to have uh, some of their students as our interns, uh, not just uh, from a uh, technical standpoint, but other degrees. Uh, we've had uh, journalism uh, degrees working with us uh, because, look, when, when you're a college student, one of the neat things about this industry is the fact that uh, all of the skills are transferable. So there's cannabis media. And I encourage anyone uh, in college that's, that's uh, getting a degree in journalism or marketing, look at the cannabis industry. There is cannabis media. It's not just about touching the plant. So we have places like Stockton, uh, universities like Stockton, uh, Cape May, Atlantic Cape Community College, uh, the community college between Cape May County and Atlantic County. They have a culinary program. And we have a strategic alliance with them. So we've started that discussion. Uh, Union County College. Uh, uh, Union County College has uh, more of a workforce development focus. So uh, everyone is working together. Uh, Raritan Valley, uh, another community college, county college. Uh, I'm working closely with them in terms of their uh, certification program. So everyone is working together to make sure that uh, there's academic opportunity, which in fact leads to economic opportunity. That's for sure. Absolutely well said. Um, so we're, and now we're also starting to see the industry. I mean, the industry, we keep talking about the cannabis industry. It's really grown up at this point. And, and there's, uh, you know, as you mentioned, Edmund, there are ancillary industries to the entire thing. But the cannabis industry itself, what are some of the responsibilities that the industry has in terms of social equity uh, from your perspective? And what are some ways that they can really address those? You know, Todd, my, my biggest concern, and I've uh, voiced this, uh, my biggest concern has been uh, as, we, as we try to develop uh, the micro licenses and the micro applicants, the, uh, the social equity applicants, as we're developing them, 
My biggest fear is that you do have larger companies that do not have their best interests at heart, that they're looking at surely, just solely making this a money play and, and uh, having these, uh, these applicants more or less become fodder, all right? Uh, my concern is uh, the, the discussions of, are coming from uh, multi-state operators who say, well, we've got a fund. We have a fund. We've got this terrific fund. We've got $30 million in a fund. And it takes them an hour to admit that your fund is a loan. What you're looking at doing is loaning money and not only loaning money and getting it back with interest, but that you demand equity in the very license, in the very business of someone who was previously disadvantaged and you want to get equity in that in that stake. Those are the things that keep me up at night when it comes to uh, leveling the playing field. So, so I, Todd, I believe the challenges are we, we've got to protect, we've got to make sure that uh, – that disadvantaged businesses, that small businesses, that the micro license, social equity applicant, and the conditional applicants are protected. We have to make sure that, that not only do they get a fair shot, but they keep their fair shot. And so those are the things that, uh, that, that concern me the most. And, and that when we talk about how we shape the industry, in particular, when we talk about social equity and leveling the playing field, for me, it comes down to one word, and it's protection. Right, right. Absolutely. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulty with Senator Santana. So I, I do want to ask you, Edmund, um, let's, let's start looking towards the future now. What's the, we're building towards something. And obviously, it's not perfect right now. There's no, no state that's perfect. We do have, like, what, 37 Petri dishes that we can choose from in terms of policy, but we're starting to whittle it down to what really works. I think I think uh, New Jersey has a, as close as we can to what right really looks like. Um, we'll see how it plays out. What's the future look like five and 10 years down the road? You know, uh, what we're looking at is, uh, well, first, as an industry, uh, all of the financial experts, right? We, we see them in MJ Biz and, and other uh, great cannabis news sources. They've taken a look at New Jersey and they're saying, look, in this first five year window, you're going to be a $2 billion industry, if not more. And, and so what I want to make sure is that people understand that that growth is not necessary, not necessarily linear that, that the, these aren't just the, the people touching the plant. These aren't just the cultivators or the vertical uh, license holders. That that $2 billion, that 2 to $6 billion uh, window is, in fact, the fact that uh, it's the hot dog vendor. It's, it's the janitorial service. It's, it's the, the law firm. It's the accounting firm. It's, it's not necessarily linear. But, but the growth potential over the next few years is tremendous. And so what we have to do is make sure that everyone is at least equally engaged in the conversation. Uh, access, access is going to vary. Uh, we've, we've just got to really make sure that we've got access and that uh, whether you're, you're applying for a license or you're an ancillary business, access, support, uh, and clearly, Todd, and, and I think you, you'll probably uh, move into this conversation at some point, if not today, in, in the near future. But but how do we train uh, new businesses? New businesses, regardless of industry, the majority fail within the first three years. So when we start talking about the future of the industry, how how do we make sure that we don't make the same mistakes that every industry makes? where you have a failure rate uh, that, that's, uh, it, it's, it's devastating. And so what we need to do, especially when we're talking about uh, applicants and potential business owners that have not, possibly have not owned a business before, uh, a, a failure in this space could be really be devastating because we're, we're looking at uh, businesses 
that are going to be family owned. You're going to see families or community members pooling their resources to go after uh, licenses. A failure in that space will be devastating because you're going to affect families again, and you're going to affect communities in the worst sense. Yeah, absolutely. And ownership must be held within those communities uh, from, from what, what we reckon. Uh, Senator Santana, may I ask you, and in case you missed the question, um, what, what are you thinking? Uh, what, what is your vision for the future of five and 10 years down the road? What's uh, the legal market in, in Michigan look like or in the region or in the country? Well, I definitely think like what we currently see in our, uh, our state is that only 4% of individual brown and black individuals um, actually have a licensure in our state. And I think when you think about the legalization of marijuana and those who uh, were a part of the illegal market many years ago or, you know, recently, I'm hope I'm hopeful that uh, from a social equity lens that those individuals have the opportunity to be in this space um, in some capacity. And because as as was mentioned by Edmund, you know, it's about families being able to provide a legacy of business ownership. And the failure rate is three years um, in a business. And so I think what needs to happen here locally and in our uh, in our uh, market space is that um, individuals who are in this business mentor from uh, others who want to be in this space uh, from a business perspective. And I think that, um, you know, as much as we can uh, take that opportunity to teach others um, how you know, individuals who are successful in this business got started. I think that's going to be very um, prevalent in order to make sure that it is sustainable in the future. I think from a, a secondary standpoint, when you look at communities like mine, uh, where you do have a high rate of poverty uh, in the community, I'm hopeful that, you know, this, you know, we will have some partnerships with our community leaders and also industry to make sure that uh, we are providing some stability in the community, um, and there's a giving back process for, um, you know, these industries that are in our districts. Um, community is very important, and so if we want to change the narrative, um, you know, of poverty and uh, just literacy and education, there has to be some buy-in from all ends um, to make sure that the investment and that we see in our communities and the investment that we see in our state from this industry, that it does go back into um, those areas of support for uh, people who live in a community. Yes, ma'am. Well said. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's my vision as well. You know, in, in 10 years from now, for me, I, I hope that the stigma of cannabis is gone, um, that it has been widely embraced both by the medical community as well as the public policy community and just communities in general uh, as a substance that can be incredibly useful and enriching and uh, a phenomenal substitute for alcohol or, or pharmaceutical medications. Um, I, and, and in 10 years, in my perfect world, uh, the VA is providing medical cannabis for its veterans uh, we are able to transport cannabis across state lines legally, and uh, the United States is seen as a global leader in, in cannabis uh, for all, all the right things. Um, and, and research will be being done across the country and around the world uh, on cannabis. And I, and I think that, that we're on the path to that. Um, in order to get there, we need true leadership and you are both providing that in, in your own states. And I wanted to say how, how grateful I am for that. Um, I just saw a quote the other day that said, uh, the, the, what does it say? The, the selfish leader uh, fears change, where the selfless leader really drives change and pushes change. And it was Simon Sinek, and I tra probably totally destroyed the, the quote, but, but <laughs> what I see in front of me are really selfless leaders, selfless leaders who are willing to, you know, um, put themselves on the line and stand up for something that they believe in. And, and uh, I know that you see the greater impact of it. Um, 
And I'll, I'll let you lead us out today, uh, Senator. Do you have any more words of wisdom for us coming out of the great state of Michigan uh, as New Jersey embarks on, on their legal, legal uh, uh, adult use pathway in this? Yeah, I'd just like to add, too, I think another part of that vision is, too, is, um, you know, right now we see where marijuana, uh, you know, from a job perspective is something that, um, you know, obviously some some corporations are deciding to test for uh, this use of this drug. And obviously you don't want people to uh, operate, you know, heavy metal or heavy, uh, uh, vehicles or things of that nature for a job, um, you know, with this in their systems, uh, it all depends, but I hope that in the next 10 years, like as we continue to learn more about, uh, marijuana and just the impact and support that it has for individuals that, that, that stigmatism from a corporation standpoint of hiring individuals will be eliminated as well, because, you know, people have a drink of wine, they, you know, uh, they smoke cigarettes or what have you. And I think that this is just a part of that um, discussion on the recreation side as well. And so hopefully we will see where that stigmatism will be eliminated in the corporation stand- from corporation standpoint. And they will hire good individuals who are uh, well capable of doing their jobs without having that be a stigmatism. So I just want to say, um, you know, this conversation is always very fluid. Um, definitely, you know, we've seen a lot and learned a lot here in Michigan as we continue to move forward in this space. Um, but I'm hopeful that, you know, as I said before, that, um, you know, those communities that have not opted in will see the benefits in the future and use it, utilize that uh, education from other cities to uh, make their decisions. And um, I think that overall, you know, the industry itself will um, definitely grow and prosper. And uh, from a medical side, I think that, you know, it will impact um, other areas like our pharmaceutical industry um, because people are going to choose a more healthier. I I, I better put a disclaimer here, but people will choose what's the best medicine for themselves. Let's put it that way. And so I think that um, that also will have a ripple wave effect on um, other industries. And maybe even we may see ourselves um, having a, um, a variation on our healthcare industry um, that's more meaningful. And um, I'm hoping to see where we go in the next 10 years. So thank you all for having me here today. It's been a pleasure. And um, yes, we yes, will ma'am. continue to work hard in Michigan to be the leader on everything. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Yeah, I, I, and I think you point to Amazon. They've, they've no longer, they've stopped uh, testing their people for cannabis and are actively uh, lobbying for cannabisization on the federal level. I think that's huge. Within government, too, uh, I'm very proud. You know, I live in Kansas City, Missouri now, and Kansas City just stopped requiring your analyses for city employees, which is a very bold and uh, forward thinking move, I think, on the part of Mayor Clinton Lucas. Uh, so, uh, hopefully, the DOD will, will recognize the uh, inefficiency and, and lack of efficacy in your analyses as well. Uh, Edmund, any any final words from you regarding New Jersey or uh, anything else we've discussed today? No, Todd, this has been a pleasure. Senator, thank you so much for all that you've done. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you, so thank you. Uh, so just to, to echo the, the sentiment, uh, New Jersey has done uh, a, a very good job of, of embracing the future and creating a platform and infrastructure to make sure that this industry is successful. Um, Ten years from now, even sooner, uh, you'll walk down a street, Main Street in New Jersey, any town, and you'll walk past a restaurant, think nothing of it. You'll either go in or continue to walk by. You'll walk by uh, a liquor store. As an adult, you'll either walk in or pass by. You'll come to a dispensary as an adult. You'll either walk in or you'll walk by it. And you won't think twice about it because it will be part of the fabric of your community. And that's our goal. Absolutely. Well, I will be walking in. And uh, I look forward to seeing (laughs) Senator, I hope to meet you in the future in person. uh, In Lansing or elsewhere. Edmund, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, it's really been a pleasure. And I hope this, and I would like to connect you too via email because I hope this is not the last time you speak. All right. 
thanks again for your time and uh, you. we'll, we'll see you soon. Cheers. Cheers.